The repository for industrial security incidents purports to be the world's largest database of security incidents in control and SCADA systems. An analysis of the data from 1982 to 2010 found that the cause of incidents affecting control systems were as follows. 50% of the incidents were accidental in nature, 30% of incidents were due to malware, 10% of incidents were due to in external attackers, and 9% of incidents were due to internal attackers. No mention was made of how many of those attacks involved physical security. Rick, taking these figures into account, what do you believe is a definition of cybersecurity? Um, good question. Security often gets, in my opinion, a bad reputation for needing to put in technologies and firewalls to protect from hackers or from an inadvertent attack. In reality, what we need to do is run our facilities in a safe, reliable, expected manner. So the challenge for cyber is to create that safe networking environment. And it becomes a programmatic approach where you apply technology in a, in a scalable and intelligent way that you then keep up to speed and up to date with procedures and processes. And it really is made or break, make or break by the involvement and the ownership from your employees. So it's people, process, and technology working together to run your facility in the way you expect it to be run. Okay, thank you. Microsoft has published a document entitled Enterprise Security Best Practices. Um, there are four stages or sections that are outlined in the document. The first stage is to assess your environment in which you're operating. Then go on to protect your network, and here we differentiate between the network and the devices on the network. Then go on to protect your servers and your clients, in other words, the devices on your network. And then the last is to monitor your environment. In other words, going back again, starting back at the beginning with the assessment to make sure there hasn't been any change. If I can ask Romano, how does your organization assess cybersecurity um, or audit the environment in which you're working? The IT department is uh, responsible for the overall security of the business line and the company itself. Okay. Um, is there anybody else in uh, any other comments? Uh, typically, can I ask Rick of you? T who's typically involved? in the assessment? Does it, is the security department involved? Well, that's actually quite an interesting question. When we perform an assessment, we do three different types of data collection. One is, of course, what's actually on the systems themselves, which can be a very technical analysis. Uh, we also look at what's written down and documented because there's often a difference between what we think is there and what isn't. But we actually check the differences against interviews with your key stakeholders. Um, what I see on paper, the way something looks like it's architected, uh, may lead to some sort of conclusions to what's critical or what needs the most protection. But the people who understand the process and the plant better are the ones who truly understand where critical assets are. So the, 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 the most important aspect of an, a, of an assessment is to uncover those true criticalities and those, de those dependencies, but to take what we found for risks and actually map an action plan out of that. If I come to your facility today and tell you you don't patch often enough or change passwords, I haven't done you any favors. If I can help you build what we find into some steps to fix it and to grow into keeping that up to speed, now we're making progress. And that's why the whole semblance of this particular session is security needs to be a program. It's something we live with day in and day out. And so we need to take that approach when we, when we address it. Kadir, you're going to say something? Uh, I think that uh, we have to split uh, the task between uh, IT and engineers and uh, industrial control network uh, engineers. Because the, the first uh, barrier in, in, uh, against hackers is uh, the IT firewalls, if you can say uh, that. After that, we have uh, a firewalls between uh, an IT uh, network and an industrial network. Mm -hmm. So we, have, uh, we should have a team between IT engineers and industrial control engineers. They should work together to protect uh, the industrial network and to protect the corporate uh, network. Carl. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I think uh, what is completely right is uh, that you have a combined team of folks that come from uh, different departments with a different point of view to the subject security to come to a, let's say, a good solution how to tackle the security issues which might occur in your organization or in your site. But um, what you first have to know is what is, uh, let's say, what are the rules and regulations you have to stick to, company rules or local rules or 
in Europe it's European rules. So uh, you have to, to make to make out or make up what rules are would you what you have you to apply and how can you address these rules and come up with an with the criticality of the systems that you uh, okay. The next stage in this, in this description was well, how does one protect the network? Um, and I think in maybe some ways you were, just, you were answering that already by talking about firewalls. So maybe if we're mo moving on to how does one protect the clients and the servers on the networks? Maybe you could have some, uh, uh, you have some input for us there? Uh, yes, so we also use uh, firewalls. Uh, to protect from the outside network and to protect the, the border between the industrial network and the, mm -hmm. the business part. We don't uh, yet at the moment have uh, some kind of intrusion detection system or uh, something uh, similar to that. Yes. But we are trying to co collaborate with the RIT department and uh, share the re responsibilities about the administration of the firewall. Carl, earlier you mentioned uh, Palo Alto as yeah. using as a, a detection system, or maybe you could elaborate on what your own organization is doing? Yeah, well, what we're trying to achieve is, let's say, a more sophisticated way of uh, analyzing and the traffic which is going through our network to find certain patterns of software which is used in our DCS systems so that we can identify uh, a certain set of let's say, recognition patterns for the loud traffic and everything which is not, let's say, known as uh, allowed traffic is forbidden. So uh, this is uh, maybe the next step of firewalling, which is more, let's say, sophisticated like we have today, where you have uh, ports and TCP streams and things like this, which can be misused by somebody who is uh, able to misuse certain protocols for other protocols. But this will be tackled um, by, let's say, more sophisticated things like I just said, detection of certain patterns. But what uh, we have to keep in mind is that we have a, um, the physical security, which is important as well, so that you have to protect your environment or in a physical way. There's no point in somebody showing up and switching off the power in a cabinet room, for example, or switching off your fireboards. It doesn't help really. Uh, Rick, you again, so you, you had something to say about, uh, about yeah, detection as well. Kind of draw back a couple of common themes, which is very good by the introduction of some of these technologies. They're all very valuable and they're all very good. Um, and one of the things that, that Carl had hit upon was that you need to be able to identify the data that comes out of them, right? So uh, to my other colleague's point here, if, if we had a combination, which we strongly recommend, of using the IT skill sets and, and resources that exist in your organization to apply them to your plant, to use that expertise as opposed to duplicating. I mean, I mean, Carl, you don't necessarily have a CCIE on the IT side as well as on the plant side. Let's use that. Let's, let's cross-share those skill sets and resources. That's really the only way to, to get value out of it. <clears throat> right. Dimitri, there's something I, I'd like to ask you. In, in, at Hellas Oil, who is responsible for cybersecurity? Is it somebody from your IT department? Is it someone from the control and automation department? Is it some unlucky bugger in the middle? I will tell you who must be responsible. Ah, okay. Uh, my opinion is that the responsible must be the DCS, mm -hmm. the operation department, not the IT department. Uh, the people from the, from the production, mm -hmm. we work in the refineries, and all people, I think the majority of them, uh, work in the refineries. We are uh, familiar with the safety. Security, cybersecurity for us is the same with the safety. So, the people from the production who understand the, sa the safety mm -hmm. must be responsible and, the, and for the security. Do you think that there's a sufficient skill set out there for people that are able to do assessments uh, and to manage IT security? Are the, uh, the production people, if you like, or the uh, automation people, or the IT people, are they suitably skilled to manage? Cybersecurity? I think that uh, it's a shared uh, responsibility for both uh, departments, IT department and uh, industrial network uh, engineer. Why? Because, uh, as I said, for example, if we want to allow uh, a control engineer to access remotely to uh, industrial control network, he has to pass through uh, a corporate uh, firewall. So mm -hmm. from the internet, he will enter his industrial network. Mm -hmm. 
So we need skills of uh, IT department. Why? Because the IT department will allow uh, this access, this external access. So he will uh, close the right uh, protocol. He, uh, he will uh, also open the right uh, port, uh, port, application uh, port. So the responsibility should be shared between uh, the two departments. Yeah, Rick, uh, I, I have a, a, a question I want to put to you. Um, that in fact, all expenditure on cybersecurity in particular is a grudge spend. Nobody wants to spend money on security. Let's face it, it doesn't add any direct impact on your bottom line. In fact, all it does is reduce your profits. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I often give the tagline that it's hard to sell cybersecurity because when cybersecurity works, nothing happens. Um, and and it's, uh, it is unfortunate that we quite often see organizations that say, we'll do this only because we have to, or they'll treat it like a project that they hit a corporate annual expectation of assessment or an external regulatory uh, minimum threshold, and they're, they're really missing the point. They're, they're spending a lot of time and money to cross something off the list. They're not really improving their robustness. And that's why I say security kind of suffers from um, an identity crisis, as I was saying. It needs to be treated more as safety, which which you had mentioned in your organization that safety and security are treated as the same sort of concept. Yeah. And I'd actually just like to ask a question, not only of the panel, but of the audience. Um, how many organizations that, that you all work for, how many of you actually have something in your HR or your, your annual goals that would, would reprimand those who fail to follow cyber policies, like sticking USB keys in, in, in production systems? Do, do you actually have enforceable policies? Any hands, anybody? Anybody that's got an enforceable policy? It doesn't look good, does it, eh? It's, it's fairly rare. I mean, I've seen a couple in the States where people have been fired on the spot for bringing in World of Warcraft and playing it on the operator station on a night shift. Um, but it's also... But it played so well. <laughs> but there's also many organizations that, that um, they don't even have a policy on the plant side because why write the paperwork and expect people to follow it if there's absolutely no repercussions, right? So that brings me back to my earlier point about it's the people that make or break it. So that's just why I was curious yeah. if, if there's... Could I ask of the team and maybe uh, anybody, uh, who in your organization, any volunteers uh, could su suggest, who's responsible for deciding how much money is actually spent on cybersecurity? Like um, uh, and who do you think should be in charge of the cybersecurity budget? You, who wants to answer? Yeah. Dimitri. Responsible for the... Uh, the budget. For the budget mm. are... Uh, Non-specialists, finally. Managers. Managers are not specialists in security, mm -hmm. in networking, etc. Yeah. Unfortunately. And From the other side, as Eric said, uh, secu security is something who uh, not, uh, not is uh, with, uh, without, uh, how to say, without a result. Mm -hmm. If all well done, yeah. yes. Well, I think exactly nothing happens. Exactly. So, yeah. why to give to give you more money to do what? To do nothing. Mo clearly, <laughs> <laughs> more <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yes. Your comments? I think that uh, concerning uh, budget is a big uh, issue. You know why? Because uh, manager should be aware of this uh, cyber criminality threats. Mm -hmm. For example, if you need to add a DMZ or uh, any uh, protection to your uh, industrial network or IT network, you have to pay uh, for router, for uh, infrastructure, for architecture uh, modification. And if you tell that to a manager, he should be aware of cyber criminality and uh, cyber criminality incident in the world in order to invest and to fund in uh, cyber uh, security. Mm -hmm. I have a question generally for uh, an opinion uh, I asked earlier. The Stuxnet inf infection that occurred in um, Iran, could it have been prevented? I anybody want to put their money where their mouth is? Rick? Uh, Rick? Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I was at a conference shortly after Stuxnet and saw an, a vendor stand up and say, if only you'd bought this product, you would have never had Stuxnet. And I got on my virtual soapbox and said, well, what happens when the next generation comes? So really, could Stuxnet have been prevented I'd rather not answer it, I'd rather say, you know what, security, security, the true measure of your security effectiveness is how quickly you detect something's happening, how quickly you shut it down and recover from it and resume normal operation. And in reality, not to be you know, a scare or fear monger, but if the bad guys really want in, they will get in. So really, the true measure is how can you detect, contain, and recover. So could Stuxnet have been avoided? I don't think so. Yeah. 
It was interesting to notice that he was saying you're done in either way. And all the security specialists on the panel all sitting there nodding their heads. This is not good news. Could I ask you, Romano, how does your organization handle mobile devices? I mean, increasingly, uh, you, we see companies where bring your own device is permitted. In other words, somebody can bring in their tablet or their mobile phone or their whatever it happens to be, and they can connect onto the organization's network. How does your organization control the use of mobile device, uh, devices that connect to your network? Uh, in the business network, uh, you need to authenticate, and that's the responsibility of the IT department. And on the industrial network, we forbidden uh, any. So we are closing all the inactive ports. So pro it's impossible to connect uh, anywhere to the, within the industrial network. Yeah. Um, any, are there any of uh, the panelists' experiences where the organization does provide a device specifically for business purposes? That, I mean, we saw earlier this morning where Honeywell now has applications that allow people to m log on and at least monitor their control network uh, with an iPad or an iPhone. Um, so what happens when that goes home and little Johnny starts playing with daddy's petrol refinery? Uh, how does one get around that? How does an organization do it? Maybe, Carl, you have yeah. some suggestions? Yeah, but what, we, what we have as a solution is a two-factor, at least, uh, stage uh, approach to log on. So that means uh, even if you get hold on this device accidentally or with intention, you have to log on with, uh, with your two-factor identification procedures and e even if you are locked on you, you can't really harm the system because you have to know others lock on procedures how to get into the system so uh, what we are not allowing is that you bring your personal devices with you and lock on to, <laughs> to our business network or to our DCS network that's completely forbidden and even what we do with external removable media meaning USB we talked a lot about USB sticks but CD-ROMs and DVDs are s still in use. So what we do is we scan them before we use them on a separate box with a protocol that is printed out to make sure that we have done what we can to make sure that these devices are secure. Uh, you can't, with Sasa, I see if you have a zero-day attack, I, will, I would say this is a residing risk that you have to take. Or you say, I don't allow it at all. But with mobile devices, I would say no way. Rick, you want to add something to that? Yeah, your question in general and, and Carl's answer in particular highlight the fact that any technology that you want, if you determine you need it for business purpose, can be deployed or can be deployed securely, really. Um, I mean, USB keys are often used to bring files in, as you mentioned, and maybe application upgrades or port data out to make business decisions. Now that Stuxnet's come and nobody wants USB keys, well, that business function can't stop. Right, so the USB key gets the bad name, but in reality, it's the business function of data movement and sharing that's required. So as an organization, you need to have a proper understanding about what your risk profile is and what business applications are absolutely fundamental, and then find a way to work within those constraints to do it as securely as possible, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you were saying. Um, by way of doing research for this panel discussion, I've been trying to find out which countries or regions of the world which uh, organizations perform better than others. Rick, are, uh, are some countries better than other countries? No, no. There's no, no one industry, country, company that's best or clearly leading. It's, it's very much, I see some very fantastic examples uh, of, of security and forward-thinking organizations, and I see some completely backwards ones. One of the examples I gave the panel earlier, there was a CIO of a major refining company that was running out of IP addresses, so he removed the firewall separating the business from the process land. Like just, it just boggles my mind. So in reality, security is still an emerging market, an emerging awareness, and emerging tools. There are some very good leaders out there. Some of the people up here, are, are what they're telling me they're doing is fantastic. Um, but there's not necessarily a clear winner in any, in any one space, region, company, industry, mm -hmm. per se. Um. Many companies control their staff's behavior in terms of, and let's use the USB stick analogy, by simply putting the fear of God into their staff. Um, they see the IT uh, support people coming along and they just, uh, or the process control people, and they just, they just run. But what happens when things do actually go wrong in the organization and there is a cybersecurity breach? Um, 
perhaps, Carl, you can tell us, if this happens in your own organization, do your staff know what they should do to help contain the breach? Do they have to shut down the entire refinery? Uh, what is, do they hit the big red button and, and, and shut down the processes? Do you have documents and policies in place that will actually help them manage the crisis when it happens? Because let's assume that it will happen. Yeah. The, what you have to do is, of course, what, what I said earlier, is that you have to have a kind of regulations and, and procedures like you mentioned. And what we did is we, we tried to, uh, let's say, to force some attacks and put uh, on uncritical systems a test virus on so that to make sure that or to test if the, the folks react accordingly and uh, yeah you have to give them some procedures but it's not the idea to shut down the complete refinery for example but they should know hopefully if it really happens that uh, whom to inform so that we can separate the DCSs for example from each other by shutting off firewall ports and things like this. Mm. Kadir, you wanted to add something. Yes, uh, in our case, uh, for example, we have, uh, choose, uh, uh, we have chosen the proactive uh, uh, hardening uh, model. So we have started by uh, mapping uh, our architecture. Afterwards, we have uh, done a risk assessment by uh, an external auditor. And then, uh, after that, I'm not going to pass to all steps. Finally, we have uh, some procedures and uh, incident response. In incident response, for example, a backup and a restore procedures are uh, a best uh, response incident. For example, if we have an incident, we should have a backup and uh, storage of our old data, and we, have, we should quickly respond to uh, this uh, incident. We haven't to stop all uh, the plant, by, uh, but uh, to restore it to uh, an initial uh, Position. Okay. Could I ask Dimitri, um, what is your organization, what does Hellas Oil do to train, inform, correct your personnel to work cyber securely on your processors, so process systems? Dimitri is in charge, uh, well, does a section of training in, in his own organization. From time to time, we make training or, uh, seminars or uh, uh, other presentations about uh, security and unsecured mm -hmm. cases okay. in, in order to, to train our people to, to come this, to the security come as a culture. This is, this is the target. Okay. Um, external connections to a process control network, they enable data exchange with your business systems and remote support, but at the same time, they increase vulnerability for cyber attacks. Uh, many of you are probably aware that Microsoft is discontinuing its Windows Live Messenger service as of March this year coming. Um, and guess what? It's replacing it with Skype. Skype will automatically install as part of your Windows installation and future versions of Windows. Um, remote support programs like TeamViewer are also increasing in popularity. Um, Proponents of both Skype and uh, TeamViewer argue that their communication protocols are encrypted. But the reality is that in Skype's case, the encryption keys are not held by you, the end user. They are held by Skype. In other words, the end user has no control over what happens to that data, this encrypted data that is trans uh, transmitting across the internet. With this in mind, um, could I ask uh, Romano, uh, what do you think, uh, what control mechanisms need to be in place to determine the safety of programs uh, used in various organizations? In my opinion, these kind of programs shouldn't, shouldn't be installed, uh, uh, especially, of course, on the industrial networks. And uh, we should uh, apply uh, uh, security policies that will, that will block that kind of uh, traffic and not allow the installation of these kind of softwares. Mm. Carl, you have some ideas on, on how does one determine whether you can trust a particular program? Yeah, what I, uh, what I liked the, in the presentation, by the way, this morning was a whitelisting of programs which is about to come. Uh, it's the, thing, the right thing uh, to, to do and uh, so that we can make sure that only the programs that we want to have in our DCS can run. This would, would be a, a good, uh, let's say, way in the right direction. But in terms of things like uh, Skype or TeamViewer, 
if we, if we could hold our, the, the encryption to key ourselves and make sure that we are the owner of the data still and have the, the data access under control. Uh, and it's, it's proven to, be, to work with our DCS, it, it's fine for me. But as, as soon as uh, we are not uh, the owner of the encryption keys, for example, and the owner of the data anymore, it's off limits. I mean, uh, this is something we cannot give to the internet or to Google or something, or share it with iCloud. I mean, <laughs> yes. Um, no way. Um, the United States Department of Homeland Security has initiated a campaign called Stop, Think, Connect. They, Rick, maybe you can comment. They, you know, they also have a National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Well, is it good enough just to have a month? No, as, um, as we mentioned before, security is a culture and it has to be baked into everything you do. In fact, I um, go back to where I graduated educationally and I sit on the committee that covers the education, the, the courses they're going to take, and, and I implore them every time I'm there that when you were to go to a trade school, the first course you take is safety, and the beginning of every class after that is a safety observation or walk around. That needs to start happening with security. Um, it's not enough just to think about it once a month or just to have some catchy, you know, fridge magnets. It needs to be baked into everything we do. And this is actually, you know, if I may take a moment, um, I often, being on the side of the vendor, bid projects with, with clients, and, and unfortunately, quite often the security expectation, if any, aren't necessarily that well entailed. So you as, a, as the owner that has these projects come in, you have the choice to put a very detailed security expectation up front so you can compare truly your different options, or you have to go back and retrofit those security things. And if we go back to my earlier point of, if we were to put security into everything we do, we would be able to establish a baseline for our organization, and as we grow over time with upgrades and acquisitions, we'd be able to maintain it much more easily. Okay. So it's not okay to just have one month. So, by the way, just a quick plug: if you are interested, the DHS also has a subpage for specifically for guidelines and checklists for process control security, like how to do patching in a production environment, how to do intrusion detection in a production environment. So it is a pretty good resource for information, though. Carl, yes, you wanted to uh, add more. Thanks. Uh, what, what I want to like to say is that uh, it's very important that everybody thinks secure, like the, like the people think safe, because if uh, if it's let's say uh, in the heads of the folks and in their minds to to be aware that if playing Warcraft, that as you mentioned, is not the intention of a DCS system and it could harm your environment and harm your plant, and if this this mindset of a secure, let's say, handling DCSs in IT infrastructure is in the people's head. I mean, that's a big, big advantage, of course. I mean, you mentioned only 9% or something from internals, but if you can get rid of this 9%, you have a big step done. Yeah. Um, McAfee estimates that there will be approximately 100 million different viruses or variants of viruses in the, in the ether by 2013. At the moment, that's about 30% up on, on what it currently is at the moment. Um, some companies actually, as, apart from trying to, uh, apart from trying to change the, uh, the behavior patterns and installing better antivirus, they also go and send their staff on hacking courses. I've personally done one. Uh, where, for example, Black Hat does a training course where they send, you can send your staff to go and learn how to hack a system. And once you know how to hack the system, you can defend against it. Uh, Carl, you also mentioned that your organization makes use of the same services, and I think, Rick, you did as well. Maybe you'd both like to comment, starting with yeah. you, Carl. If, if, if it's possible to, to join a course like this, we try to train certain folks on, uh, on hacking technologies, even it, it just to, to do what you said, to, to be aware of the risks and to find uh, methods against it, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you were going to say, Rick? Yeah, it's, um, the hacking course, I think, is, and understanding how that works is, I think, invaluable as a building block to help you understand how to look at your systems as opposed to, let's put in this system, turn on the application, it's doing what it should, that's great. But all the risk that's associated with that maybe isn't thought of. The challenge, though, that I find is that hacking and making sure we're that level of security or security awareness is, for many organizations, a bit of a stretch. We talk about the programmatic approach that we've been talking about. Um, we did a penetration test at a refinery, and we found our way in because there was an FTP uh, server 
sitting up top, and it had a, uh, a known vulnerability that was three years old. So that's not necessarily a measure of how good my hacking team is. That's more a, a, an indictment of the fact that their patching program was woefully inadequate at making sure it took care of all their systems. So I'm not saying it's not valuable. I'm saying it's absolutely invaluable. But there's a lot of low-hanging fruit we can take today to make ourselves significantly stronger right out of the gate without having to be super you know, uh, security experts and being able to hack our way into things. Uh, Kadur, yes, you wanted I, to comment? I think that uh, hacking uh, courses uh, is the best thing for uh, personnel because uh, we should uh, think like a hacker in order to protect our uh, networks and uh, to, uh, to hamper and to hinder uh, these uh, attacks from uh, external uh, hackers. So we have to think like them. Okay. Um, on the subject of uh, this, can we move on to behavioral changes within organizations? Um, because clearly, as we said, simply protecting against the viruses or the malware is not going to, uh, is not going to change anything. Um, uh, Carl, any comments on behavioral, how one mandate, uh, how do you force behavioral changes as an organization? Is it one of education? Is it one of... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a multi-stage approach, of course. You try to inform folks as they show up on the refinery uh, and they work with us that we have not only safety but also security and data security or cyber security and you have some some easy to understand let's say uh, security information how to how to handle security and then we have a, a procedure where you have to follow to to be able to to work in this in this environment and you you should really follow with this um, per, uh, permission to work that to make sure that um, you act as or do the work as secure as possible. So that, that's the way we do it with the day-to-day -day work. Yes, you wanted to add. I agree with this, but how can you be sure that everyone follows the procedures if there is no penalties for not following uh, these kind of procedures or then what is the point? Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's my opinion. Uh, we spoke earlier about physical security. Kadir, maybe you could tell us about uh, how do you manage, how does your organization manage the barrier between physical and let's call it logical security or cyber security? How do you, uh, does the security department interact regularly with the cyber security department? No, uh, we have no uh, connection with the security department. The, uh, the industrial control the department manage uh, the, the physical uh, access to, uh, uh, to industrial control uh, appliance. For example, we have uh, switches and the control room uh, restriction. We have access restriction. So we manage this uh, restriction and uh, uh, no person is allowed to enter uh, the switch and the data center uh, room. There's a physical uh, barrier. Only uh, uh, personnel of uh, industrial control network and IT uh, personnel can access uh, this uh, control room. Uh, Rick, do you think there's a, um, a perfect environment? Uh, what do you think is the ideal, uh, ideal manner of managing a convergence between physical and cybersecurity? Uh, that's, that's a tough one because it's, it's very much an emerging thing as, as, as physical security becomes more important and, and cyber becomes more important. And in fact, if you look at a lot of industries historically, the physical security has come up in importance kind of real quick and then they come back and do cyber after the fact. And they're realizing there's a lot of overlap, yet there's a lot of duplication between them. Um, to your point, I have a picture of my friend's refinery and there is the $6 an hour janitor in their server room you know, with full access and a ring full of keys, right? Um, that's an issue. We have another client who had a regulatory requirement to do physical security controls um, and the physical team did it, ran with it all by themselves, not using any of the electronic baseline standards. So the electronic team had to come behind them and harden all those servers and do it all over again. So I think that as we see more impetus towards it, there will be much more of a convergence. And in fact, that one particular industry, um, the next generation of regulation will require that if there is a physical breach, that it needs to be acted upon in real time. So now we're talking back to operators looking at a board so tying your physical into some sort of real-time reporting is, is going to be a requirement. So that it, the, if the line's not completely crossed yet, it will be very soon. Kadir, yes? I think uh, that uh, also a new technology, RFID technology. So uh, every personnel have a badge with the RFID identification. 
So uh, any access uh, to a control room or a switches room is uh, logged into a server. So we know that person what he have done at this uh, moment. So we have a watch on uh, physical access. Okay. Uh, could I ask Carl, how does your organization handle? Yeah, it's uh, pretty much, or it's pretty similar to what he just said, that we have uh, access to cabinet rooms uh, only to a limited, uh, let's say, person, person uh, that, that have a key to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to trust these guys that they don't, let's say, breach into our system because these are the folks who work there and which are responsible for the DCS mm -hmm. system. And uh, but we are not using RFID scan. Not uh, for the moment. No, yeah. Not in the yeah. moment. I think this would be a problem due to uh, regulations. But uh, in, in reality, we lock the rooms, the cabinets, and only give the access to a certain person uh, or unit. So that. Okay. Uh, could I ask you, Rick, would you mind just elaborating a little bit on ISA NC 99 and uh, some of the weaknesses that you think the regulation has in place, a speed of adoption and that sort of thing. So the ISA 99, for those who aren't familiar with it, is um, it's primarily more, it started as more of a North American uh, process control security program. They have been working with their international partners and international um, contributors to turn it to more of an international, so the IEC, or it's also called ANSI, A-N-S-I. Um, and the intent is that it's written by process control people for process control environments. Um, the challenge with it today is that it is written by like Honeywell's Kevin Staggs and, and um, uh, Eric Cosman of Dow uh, and, and Brian Singer, who you may, may, may know, people that have been doing cybersecurity forever. The problem is they all have day jobs, so it's a little bit long in the tooth in how long it's taken to get there. The benefit is because it's written by people who actually live in, and die in these environments, it's much more applicable to this, to this environment. Um, they're always looking for participants uh, of all sorts, and international uh, contribution is, is absolutely um, uh, encouraged. And some of the sub-products are very, very valuable. For example, the Working Group 6 is just finishing the, um, it's about a 67-page how-to document now on how to patch um, in a production environment. And it's actually being written by somebody, quarterbacked by somebody who's been doing this for about 15 years. So it's some very real hands-on lessons. It's a very valuable source of information and they always appreciate even more input so on the one hand look for it it's coming it's taking a little while but there's a lot of value in it so good things are worth waiting for I guess. You were speaking yesterday about um, some of the problems associated with patching for example rebooting of systems on maybe uh, using WSS uh, maybe you could elaborate on that in other words the actual the balance that one has to draw between patching a machine immediately to get the security update versus restarting yeah. the entire plant. Well, this, so at a higher level, it almost goes back to my earlier point where I'm, I'm, I'm very much encouraging um, cooperation between IT and, and process because let's take patching for a perfect example. Um, corporate has IT people that understand WSUS and, and can do proxy servers out to the internet to bring patches, to bring them down, et cetera, help you set it up. You don't need to learn it from scratch. But when we get those patches to the WSUS server, there absolutely has to be a production person that says which patches can actually be put where, whether that's from your vendor like Honeywell approving it, or whether that's because it's a legacy system. So this is where you get the blend and the promise between the two um, to be able to say, look, we're going to automate and use as much of IT technology and skill set as possible to bring it to my door, but then from there we need to run forward with it. Now, in a lot of cases, you might have a patch that comes out and we say, well, we need to patch this. It may not bring us to our knees, but we don't have another outage window for six months. Well, that's where you want to look at creative things like upstream firewall rule sets or turning off services. Quite often, we find that a lot of applications in the production environment are installed with default services. Like, for example, um, Internet Explorer's www service has about 50 different things of which most viruses are written for. Um, most production environments only need the www service. You can turn everything else off, minimize it. It's a, it's a form of hardening the system. So there's, there's different ways to be creative, and unfortunately, if you read the working group six from ISA 99, you'll find that patching, as an example, is something that we'd like to automate, we'd like to do more regularly, but in reality, when we get to the production environment, we have to be creative in what we actually do with those tools and technologies. Again, that's why I can't say enough about having an IT guy, whether they're helping you with virtualization or patching or antivirus, 
come and say, oh, well, the application can do this, and then the production guy can say, well, that would work for us because that, this, this application will live in that world. So, yeah. Carl, could you elaborate? How does your organization uh, limit patches or control yeah. the up, uh, release of patches, yeah. service packs, uh, updates, not only to the standard Windows operating environment, but also to Honeywell's patches that are being released? Exactly, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, it, the WSUS issue is a real issue, or there has been an, or still is an issue in our side in an organization globally, I would say, because really try to, to implement the patches as soon as they release, especially if they are security related. But I must say, here's the but, the Honeywell sometimes changes the default Microsoft patches, this is one thing, and gives additional information to the, to, the, to the engineers in the field, like if you implement this patch, you have first have to shut down this service, and then you implement the patch, and then you restart the service. If you use the standard Microsoft WSUS service, this information gets lost, that's one thing. And the other thing is, you have to, if you implement the patch to your system, you have to be sure that it does not harm your system in a way you would not like, you would not like it. So first is you must be sure that this patch is approved from Honeywell and that you get all the information for the, for the patching pr that you need. And if the patch is applied, that the system works after the patching still like it should be. So what we do is we, we try to implement the patch on a not critical system. And if it works there for a couple of days, or weeks, a week at least, then we, we uh, put the systems to, uh, to the next stage, means on all systems with an uh, even number, and then to the system with the odd numbers to make sure we implement the patches as soon as possible. But if something goes wrong, like, like we had with an OPC patch two years ago where all the OPC connection was canceled, then uh, this, this would uh, shut down your complete refinery immediately. So this is something uh, where you have to be very careful to, to just apply IT standards. I mean, it's a different thing if uh, an Outlook server goes down for two hours and 2,000 people are, are free of new emails. I mean, maybe it's a good idea to do so. <laughs> but this is not a good idea in a, in a production plant. So this is a very critical thing. The same is with antivirus. It's very critical. And you have to really have folks on site to make sure that what you apply to the system does not harm the system in a bad manner, so that you reach the opposite that you want it to. Yeah. Rick, could I ask you uh, to tell us something about the service that Honeywell offers for management of security, cybersecurity, in your client's environment? Yes. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier today was the fact that Honeywell has announced the, the, the business that I that I'm supposed to run. Uh, it's called Industrial IT Solutions. And we find it's important because it's, it's our statement that we understand security needs to be a program. Um, we have great technology, very proud of the technology we have. We announced application whitelisting. We're talking about virtualization. These are all fantastic, but these are just tools in the toolkit. If we come to your organization and put an application whitelisting on R4XXX and walk away, that's just a small piece of the overall picture. What we want to continue to do and what we've done by the formation of this group is to provide services across that life cycle. And I don't know if you remember from the original video, it talked about security being a life cycle. You start with an assessment, you do that probably at least once a year, preferably. Sometimes it's done a little less. And from the assessment you find ways to improve and that's where we put in technologies and tools like application whitelisting or virtualization or, or virtual patching. And from there we switch to management and we've done lots of work with our clients to help to put in manageable procedures, policies, processes, and in fact, in many cases, we help augment the staff to keep that up to date. Because that's the real magic. If you put in a lot of technology and spend a lot of money only to have it age from the minute you end that project till now, you start to lose less and less value out of that technology. So the real maintenance is the key. And then the final phase, the assurance, is some of the stuff we're working on for the next generation. That is, we spent all this money, we have all these tools to show us how secure we are, but each of them sits in the, their own little database, their own silo of information. We're working with some of our vendors and some of our developers to pull a lot of that information together. So instead of just looking at my patching profile saying this system's up to date, I can also pull up from the backup solution that it's up to date, but it hasn't had a successful backup in three months. So you get your true security profile. And that sort of helps with the, 
the overall life cycle. And we have done um, anything from assessment to remediation to boots on the ground helping um, for multiple industries around the world since about 1999. So I've probably seen it. Uh, and, and not just Honeywell Systems. In fact, today I have a couple of guys at a couple of plants in, in the US um, running patches in general, not just Honeywell, and following regulated change management, test procedures, filling out the paperwork, et cetera. So we realize that it's a big burden. We realize that it needs to be a program, and so we want to grow our services to help you with that, regardless of your maturity level and your, and your budget or your technology. Um, so I can take it then that because you're providing the service, you're guaranteeing that people won't get viruses on their system? Absolutely not. No? Absolutely uh, not, no. What, what do you guarantee then? Uh, well, it, just like if you were to go to the doctor and he were to tell you to get on a treadmill and drink less, so you wouldn't die of a heart attack, right? Like, he, he'll give you that guarantee? Uh, yeah. yeah. So what I can guarantee you this is that um, you work with us, we'll help to improve your security posture, we'll remove some of that low-hanging fruit, we'll make it harder for you to have a significant incident. When you do have an incident, we also have services to help recover and, and contain if you want. Uh, really, it's, it's realizing that this is a partnership in a difficult area and there's no such thing as bulletproof. So what's the most we can do to help you get, to remember my first statement, the reliable expected operation of your facility. We can get you back to that as fast as possible. We've both done something right. All right, All right. Um, so just as a wrap, just to confirm what we said earlier, cybersecurity is not about just protecting from outside hackers. Uh, it's not just about Stuxnet. It's not about the flame virus. Um, it's more than just preventing a particular government's uh, a country's government from engaging in espionage to another country's government. Um, I put it to you that cybersecurity is about the safe, reliable operation of your facility. Um, I'd like to thank our, our panelists for part their participation today. Um, a reminder that you've got uh, about a 30 to 40 minute coffee break now before your next breakout session start, and thank you very much for joining us.